Hello and welcome back to the Scale Modelling Cafe. My name is Jamie and welcome to the final part of the Academy 172nd Scale F14 Tomcat. In this episode I'm going to do the base coat and the weathering and then finish off the project. So base coat. As we saw in the previous episode the model has been primed and now I'm laying down the top camouflage colour which in this case is MRP Barley Grey, otherwise known as Camouflage Grey now. As you can see, the way I'm building it up is I'm doing overlapping uh, layers at 90 degrees to each other, primarily, and then I'll go in and just sort of randomly fill in uh, the surface, making sure I've got a good solid opaque coat. And that's what I'm after. Moving on to the rest of the airframe now. And you can see some uh, light overspray there. That's just some of the primer and a lighter paint just to just try to kill the dark uh, overspray from when I did the burner cans. We saw that in the previous episode. I'm holding the airbrush quite close to the surface and it's a relatively low air pressure. The MRP is very thin. It's very opaque, but it but it is very thin. So you definitely can't flood the surface. And we just want to sort of build up the layer slowly. And the aim is to try and preserve as much of that surface detail as absolutely possible. Now onto the weathering, and the, well I say weathering, it's actually more part of the base coat. I thought I'd give these splatter masks a go. These are from Ushi van der Osten. So taking the base coat and darkening up with a bit of extra dark sea grey, I just used the splatter mask, held it really close, pretty much touching. In fact it is touching there, isn't it? Um, and then sprayed the darker tone over the top to get this irregular pattern. Try to keep it random and just going in, filling in, having a look, adding a little bit more and actually want a little bit too much contrast because all the other weathering layers are going to tone it down and you can see there the the darker tone but I just thought that was a bit too sharp as it were, a bit too defined. So I put the mask to one side and then just did some classic post shading with the darker tone along some of the panel lines and in a random cloudy effect and just trying to blend in that sort of harsh, dark or darker areas from the splatter mask. And that softened the effect quite nicely. Now, it's easy to end up with a, with a big bland aeroplane because it is a single colour on the top and underneath. So all these effects really help to, to weather down the paint, break up that monochrome look. So taking darker tones of the base coat and lighter tones of the base coat, I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to, again, break up that solid surface. So I've used the splatter masks. I'm also, as you can see here, using the airbrush just freehand and just softening the effects. So I don't concentrate the darker tones on panel lines and then the lighter tones in the middle. I don't like that effect. It's not realistic at all when you look at pictures of real aeroplanes. But what I, what I do like to do is use the lighter tone over the panel lines in almost like a reverse classic shading technique. When you look at the real thing, light will catch the edge of panel lines and they will appear lighter. And using a lighter tone, this is a good way of trying to replicate that effect. And it's, it's actually quite subtle. You don't necessarily see it unless you know you're looking for it but it does a really good job of breaking up that surface. Uh, 
and you can see the different tonal effects there on the on the tail fin. So here's the overall effect. It's quite nice and if you think it's a little bit overdone that's actually a good thing because we are going to go in with subsequent weathering layers and even varnish layers which will help to tone it all down. Now there's a lot of masking here. The top surface as I mentioned was barley grey or camouflage grey. The undersurface is light aircraft grey and I didn't have any um, which is a bit of a shame. So what I ended up having to do was mix up my own and using a base of the US Navy light gold grey and then adding various whites, um, greys, uh, I came up with this tone that that I thought was a fairly close match when I looked at some of the photographs I could see in the references. I don't know how accurate it is. I mean, you could look at 10 different photos of the same aeroplane taken on different days from different angles and they'll all look different. But when I re removed the masking, I was actually quite pleased with the tone. It, it's a nice warm gray. It is actually quite light as the name would suggest. And again, just using the same technique, this is just laying down the first layer, the base coat. And you can see on the wing with the shine how I'm actually overlapping the paint. And I'm spraying into the painted surface as well. So any overspray is just going to go onto the onto the where I want it. And I didn't really do much of the splatter mask effect on the underside because it's going to be more heavily weathered uh, with oils etc so I didn't see the point to be honest there was a little bit of lightening in places but not too much and you'll see the nose wheel bay that's painted white as we saw in the in one of the earlier episodes and I didn't mask it because I'm going to go in and I'm going to uh, mask off and spray the main undercarriage bays so I just touched that in at the time and there we go the classic REF camouflage for a not classic RAF F-14. The wing walkways. So these were sprayed as you can see. Academy does supply decals for this. But I just thought it, I'd get a much better effect. Uh, if I painted them on. Even though the decals are actually really really good. And the advantage of spraying is... You can obviously pick the tone you want. Here, quite a faded black I used. Again, that was mixed up from MRP colours. Black with a bit of bit, um, a little bit of buff in there. Just to lighten it up and give it, a, again, a warmer tone. So it does complement the other colours. And obviously, it really helps with all the surface detail. Because you haven't got deco film covering it up. And... Yes, even though it's a lot of masking, it is a lot quicker, if I'm honest. So just using the tweezers to pull off the small bits. Now trying to get this all square, that, that, was a, that wasn't entirely straightforward. But you've got all the panel lines to help you and the other raised detail bits. And I think that's a much more pleasing effect than using the decal. The, the decal was black and I didn't want black here. You've got to be careful. You can see the aerials are in place. They're actually very solidly mounted on big lugs that go in. So they are nice and solid. They do need a bit of fairing in, but obviously they do stick out. So you do have to be careful. They're not bulletproof. And luckily I didn't manage to snap any off. And here's the final effect. And I think that is much better than a decal, to be honest. Now for some natural metal. Now the leading edges of the wings and the tail planes, they are metal. I'm assuming that's some kind of anti-icing kit. So again, a lot of masking uh, and a gloss black base coat, again MRP, and then some Alclad steel to go on over the top. 
Now, normally when spraying metallics, I'd absolutely cover the airframe with masking and, uh, and normally tinfoil actually, which is a really good way. It conforms, it, it covers really, really well, obviously, and just seal that in with a little bit of tape. But I was brave on this occasion and I didn't feel the need and I didn't get any overspray, which is good. I also sprayed the 25 Squadron tail stripes. So the main area was masked first and then had a black undercoat. Then I masked off the stripes and then sprayed the silver gray color. And that was just owl clad and a bit of medium sea gray. And obviously there's no decals for this. And in hindsight, maybe the black is a little bit too thick but spraying them on, that's a you know, really nice effect, I thought. And now for a bit of rubber wing sweep boot. Don't quite know what the, uh, what the technical term is. A seal, maybe? So again, I mixed up a, a rubber colour. So again, using MRP black as a base and then some hull red from Tamiya. A bit of buff, just for that sort of rubbery tone, and an awful lot of masking. Now these obviously are separate pieces, and I could have painted them separately, and then glued them in after I'd painted, but I did find I did need quite a bit of fettling of the sort of pins and lugs and things to, to get them in, and they were a tight squeeze, so I found it easier just to, to do that, to glue them in, and then just clamp them in place and it just kind of sealed them in. But, as you can see, you are committing yourself to a lot of masking and an awkward spray job. And there is the base coat finished. Yeah, the rub is a little bit shiny, but it's gonna have a, a satin coat. And this is what I always do. In between the layers, I always polish. So, the primer was polished and now the base coat's getting a polish, just being careful around the nose there, around all the sticky out bits. And this just helps to smooth the aeroplane because I am going to put a gloss coat on for the decals. And it just helps to keep everything really nice and smooth. And here is the aeroplane glossed and decaled. So a mix of decals, um, extra decal, kit decals and some stuff from the spares box. And what I tend to do these days is I polish over the top of the decals. I just find it just helps to blend them in a little bit just before sealing them in with a varnish coat. And I used uh, some VMS satin varnish on this model, which sealed them in really very nicely. I'm wet sanding with Trizact. I think that's 3000 grit, if I remember. And that would just kill the shine from the decal film and help blend it into the paintwork. Just doing the no steps and the stenciling. The stenciling actually was from the kit and they performed really, really nicely. So if you are going to make this um, kit and use the kit decals, then I can highly recommend them because they, they went down really, really nice. I used ammo setting solutions. Uh, and they work brilliantly. But some of the stenciling around the nose was a little bit too too harsh, I thought. The stencils in the kit um, and the markings are for a high-vis, light gold, grey, white aeroplane. And obviously this is a low-vis. So I ended up taking some of, those, some of those stencils off. I just thought it was a bit too in your face, really. It didn't really fit with the scheme. And the very last bits is, is mine and my observers from the Lynx name that I took from the uh, 815 squadron decal sheet from from uh, extra decal and that's my name on the canopy which, which I thought was a bit neat a bit of fun right so that sort of concretey colour is the oil wash for the underside mixed up from lots of oil brushes and uh, various other oil paints 
And I always try and mix up a colour that complements the base coat. So that could get quite complicated if you've got a sort of two, three or four different camouflage colours on an airframe. I'll tend to mix up a an oil wash for each colour just because the tone needs to complement it and also and also the contrast. You can't have too much contrast. And I am a fan of the sludge wash because I find it easier just to work that oil paint into all that recessed detail. Yes, the pin wash is nice and efficient, but I do find that it doesn't it doesn't go quite far enough a lot of the times into the into panel line detail. Um, and I end up having to go and do multiple coats and things. But a sludge wash, it's it's thicker than a pin wash, and I just work it all into that detail and and I just find it works better for me. So you can see that's quite a warm grain grey tone for the underside. The up, the upper tone is obviously it's bluer, so that was a that was a bit had a bit more contrast, which caused problems as you see in a second. But I'm just removing the the remnants now from all the corners with a with a cotton bud or Q-tip. If you're from that part of the world that calls it a Q-tip. And the advantage of using this is, is getting right in the nose, those nooks and crannies, it will polish the paint as well. So here's that darker tone I was talking about. It's darker and it's slightly more blue. And I just thought I'd show you this time how I remove the, uh, remove the excess wash using kitchen towel. And by rubbing it like this, it... I'm, I'm rubbing quite gently if I'm honest because if you rub too hard you're just gonna you're just gonna remove the wash from the detail and that's obviously not what we want um, sometimes if you've got really fine panel lines it it's quite difficult to avoid it so you might have to go back in and with a little bit more wash in those areas but this technique I think is is a lot quicker than than a pin wash as well It's on a glossy surface, so it's quite easy to remove. And there we can see the wash removed, but that contrast is too much. And I didn't like that at all, to be honest. It's not too bad further down the back end, but that needed fixing. And you can see on the right hand side, it's been fixed. The way I fixed it is I could have done another wash, a lighter tone, but I just took some of the lightened base coat and just decided to overspray the panel lines. It's neat, the MRP paint. It's not been thinned, but it did a good job of just enough, just knocking back that extra contrast. So you can still see the panel lines, but they they appear a lot, a lot sharper and they just blend back into the paintwork a little bit. So you can still see them. But that effect is is much better, I think. And you can see how quick it is. And again, it just adds another layer and a little bit more depth to the overall finish. And I think you'll agree that's much better, especially around the nose. That's much more in keeping. Okay, tail planes. Um, I did think they might be a bit vulnerable, even though that is quite a big thick tab. So I just drilled and uh, put a pin, that's all the way through the fuselage, that's only one part. And that holds it nice and tight there, and that is a lot more, a lot more robust. There's the other side going on. And of course you can remove them, if, if you'd want to remove them, I don't know why you would, but, but you can remove them. And should you break them off, it's going to be a much easier to repair, I think. And that concludes this part. So join me in the next part where we finish off the weathering and bring together the final project. See you then. Bye bye.